Hi there, and welcome to another Poultry Keepers podcast. This episode concludes Rhode Island Reds, an American classic. We hope you enjoy our conversation and pick up some good tips on Rhode Island Reds along the way. So let's start where we left off last week. With that in mind, every time somebody I see in these groups, people are like, I'm looking for fresh blood for my birds. Mm -hmm. My first question is why? What are you trying to fix? Because unless you bring in something that's like that, like a like showstopper show bird, you could be throwing in a wrench and having to start completely over Mm -hmm. messing up what you have done. So Excuse me, I'm sorry. No. If you ever find yourself feeling that way, that you absolutely got to bring in unrelated blood, my suggestion is get it from a related line. In other words, mm-hmm. find somebody else that has a line of birds that you have mm-hmm. and get one from them that has the qualities you want. That way you won't be starting over. Exactly, exactly right. And people get scared when they've been line breeding and all of a sudden they get a hatch that is completely ugly and a whole lot of defects all of a sudden. And instead of getting scared and getting new blood, they need to push through that because on the other side is a lot pure line. Okay. Mm-hmm. And they don't understand that they're headed Absolutely. the right direction. They just don't know it. Okay. Yeah. And you, you pick through the uglies and you you breed again, right? And in the next generation, a lot of those defects will be gone if you can get through that one or two really ugly generations. Ruthless culling. New new blood is always a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. I've had that happen to me. And when I stopped and thought about it and really evaluated the birds, it was not so much the bird's fault is that I hadn't put the best birds that were best matched together mm-hmm. with breeders. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the mm-hmm. fault was actually my fault and not the yeah. bird's mm-hmm. fault. You have the bloodlines. The bloodlines are already there. You know that you have the bloodlines. You just have to push through that that mistake or that ugly. Yeah. And there's good stuff on the other side. But yeah. every time some whenever you bring in new blood, you're starting over. Mm-hmm. People don't understand oh, yeah. you are starting over. And you don't know what you're bringing in. I don't care how good the breeder is or the person is or whatever, or how many ribbons they got. You don't know what you're bringing in. You yeah. know what you own, but you yeah. don't know what you're buying. A good, good example of that is is my hatch this year. I've got pullets that, that are coming up that are, are outstanding. Every male that I hatched in his crock pot. And I started to worry, and then I thought, no. I've got the birds here still on the property that produce Ripalicious. It's there. It's just me figuring out the puzzle pieces to who did goes to with who. Yeah. Yep. Mr. Reese had a saying, always keep your blueprints. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Nope. Yep. Yep. You're right. I read it on nope. the birds that are in the back. They're my egg layers. And I keep all my yes. breeders separate up on the hill. And yep. if I ever screw up on the hill... I just go shopping in my backyard. There you go. <laughs> yep. Yep. Rip, a while ago you made mention about the feathers and we were talking about the blacking on the feathers and that kind of stuff. Shaggy on YouTube wants to know how hard should the feathers be? Shaggy, I would want feathers on a red to be somewhere between the look of the feathers on a leggern and maybe an Orpington, something like that. Somewhere in between those. You want it tight, not real tight. You don't want it real loose either. Yeah. And they're because of the red color, they're prone to dry out. Yes. That's why when you're conditioning birds, it's a good idea to keep a squirt bottle of water. Yeah. Over there where you condition it, go by once or twice a day. Or let them out. Give them a little bit. Let them out in the rain. (laughs) Yep. So for me in the summertime, I, listen to Jeff, even though sometimes he thinks that I don't listen to him. I'm sure. Often um, you don't. I, I went through, I bought, Jennifer has got me addicted to Timu. And I, don't know. I was on Timu one day and one of their flash sales that they do that's 
almost as bad as going in into a big box store and you hearing the chick sound. It was misters for your deck. And it's like the tube with the fittings, the T fittings where you can screw in the misters. And I was like, Jeff always says that this is good in the summertime to help keep them cool. And they talk about doing it to keep the feathers moist and it helps them stay healthy and this, that, and the other. So now in all of my breeding pens, I've got misters and they'll cut on about one o'clock in the afternoon and they'll cut off about three. Plenty of time to dry up before the sun goes down. I always got wind. A lot of mine have uh, fans in them to dry the ground, so I don't have to worry about that. But it, it really does make a difference on their feathers. Makes a big difference. Let's see. Tim also says that he bred reds for 25 years. It can be great breed, but very challenging. Yes, I agree. So many people don't understand just how challenging reds can be. Mm -hmm. I put no, them right up there. Goes, with... That goes for anything that you're going to be detail orientated about. Yeah. When you're breeding birds, you got to be detailed. You, mm -hmm. you got to pay attention to the details because yeah. it'll bite you if you don't. Mm -hmm. And you can find yourself running down a rabbit hole really quick. Mm -hmm. mm, done yep. that. Yep. <laughs> And you can't just focus on one thing. You got to have no. it. It's the whole, there's three pages of check boxes. But Sue, I want to add one thing onto that. You're right. Mm -hmm. You can't focus on just one thing, but when you try to correct a problem, when you're first starting out, I would focus on one problem, try to yep. correct it at a time. Yep. If you try to correct five or six, oh, it'll drive you nuts. You won't get there. You got to look today, tomorrow, and two years from now. All right, this next question is, Jeff, have you ever uh, shown birds? Have you ever been a show bird person? No. All right, so this no. question is going to be, we'll go from left. Or we'll start with Jennifer. We'll let her answer, and then Sue, and then we'll, we'll let Rip answer this question. How do you house your show birds and keep them show ready? And I think people are going to be really surprised at how this question is answered. <laughs> if we're talking about like right before the show, is that what we're talking about? Yep. How do you house your show birds and keep them ready for a show? So I would think that's if you're going to the Ohio National in a couple of weeks, from now to then, what are you doing with that bird? I have soft feathered birds, so I would wash them like 10, 12 days in advance. And then I set the whole alleyway of my barn with drop pins on the floor. With, and I just dump the shavings over the top and keep them in there. And every day, 14 times a day, you got to go by there and clean out the shavings, dump more in there. And make sure they're not close enough that they're fighting between the cages. And I have had one jump up and hung himself the day before a show. So now I lay stuff on top of the cages to keep them from doing that again. So it's it's a learning process all the way up until that morning. All right. Sue, so how do you, and I'm laughing because I have a clue you know, where you're going with this, <laughs> but how do you house your show birds and keep them show ready? I try to keep their pens as clean as possible year round. It's, right. And some days I do well and other days I don't. But two birds that won for me the best, one was picked off the ground the morning of the show or the morning before I left to go to the show. So she was not even washed. And the other bird had his butt and legs washed and taken. I just, I feed them good. I take care of them. They get outside. They get on green grass. They have fresh air. They're chickens. They do what they want to do, but I just try clean water, clean fresh food. I don't put them in conditioning pens. I just don't. They stay with everybody else. And you let your chickens chicken. I let my chickens chicken. The one girl that honestly, the one girl that won Knoxville in 21, I went out there to load up at five o'clock in the morning and 
she was standing there and I thought, you look pretty good. So I just picked her up, checked her bottom, make sure she didn't have bugs, threw her in a box and away we went. She won the whole show. <laughs> so, or she won large, champion large fell. I won't say she won the whole show, but it definitely shocked me because I didn't think anybody pay any attention to those crew. So they but did. they did. They did. Yep. <laughs> yep. What yep. about you, Rip? How do you house your show birds? <laughs> I'm a lot like Sue. Um, <laughs> Leave them outside, let them run around, let them be chickens. Yeah. Uh, I can honestly say I have never washed a Rhode Island red to take it to a show other than to wipe off the face and wipe off the feet and legs. Make sure the butt's just, clean. Just never needed it. Wipe them down with a silk cloth. That'll get the, the dust off of them, shine them up a little bit, rub a little uh, of my comb dressing on their face and waddles and comb. And that's real simple to make. It's 50% alcohol and 50% olive oil. Yeah. Shake it up and rub it on there. The, the alcohol helps redden the comb and the olive oil makes it shine. Yeah. And do the same thing, use the same thing on the feet and legs too. Yeah. But if That's I'm going good. all out to condition a bird, I'll put it in a show coop, bring it inside for about 10 days or so. And I want to get it used to showing against strange birds. So I'll shuffle or order the birds around. I don't, every day I move them around. I play a radio in there, get them used to strange sounds. I even have some audio that I recorded at a show. So I, that's usually what I play. Just common sense stuff. Yeah. Don't overthink it. Yeah. This is not a breed that requires a lot of primping and carrying on with them. Yeah, we're we're not doing it. It's not table dancers. No. <laughs> Let's see here. I'm trying to get uh, that image out of my head now. Yeah, Lordy. <laughs> Tim says type has been the most challenging. Most have lost the true brick shape. That is true. Amen, yep. Tim. Let's see. We only have some quail and small backyard mixed flocks of chickens trying to learn as much as possible and convince the better half that we need some farmland. I hate to say it, but you don't need a lot of land. Mm -mm, I have one acre. You That's just got to, you just got to have your pens and, and, if you don't have a lot of land to have big pens, you just got to work extra hard to condition your pens. Yeah. Yep. And, and keep them clean. Keep them clean. As, right. Honestly, as far as raising birds and, and getting them in good shape and good condition, reds are pretty easy. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. good feed, good management, good mm -hmm. water. You're yep. good to go. Yeah. Let's see. Sue and Rip, do you track egg numbers and are you tracking individual matings? Yes and yes. No and no. <laughs> but Sue's the rebel. I am. I, I am. know. But I, honestly, I can look at some of my females and I know exactly which male they came out of and real close to which female they came out of because I have a limited amount of birds. I have more now because I hatched a lot, but no, Tim, this spring is, Sue's going to be a better manager. Yes. Yep. Sue has a better memory than I do. I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell by looking at them. They each have their own kind of little quirky thing. The fem each of my adult females. See, back in the day, Sue, I was, I had 10 breeding pens. Yeah. So wow. I, I just. There's no way I could keep track of that with my feeble brain. Yeah. Yeah. One day. One day. <laughs> How do you manage a trip to the Ohio National or somewhere where you drive a, an extended period of time? How often would you stop and tend to your birds or do whatever and then start again? Coming from Oklahoma, it was almost between 14 and 16 hours. And we stopped to use the bathroom, eat lunch, and do that. But they rode in extra large show boxes where they had plenty of room to stand up, move around, or dog kennel, the great big dog kennel things. And they had food and water inside the, the dog kennels. So they had room to move around. They made the trip just, they made the trip better than I did. Yes. Every time. <laughs> I do it a little bit different than Sue. I, I don't use a, a big box to carry the birds in, but they do have feed and water available. All I want them to be able to do is stand up and sit down. 
Because when yeah. birds start turning around in some of those boxes, is when they start ruining yeah. tail feathers. Yeah, yeah, tearing up feathers. So I guess for that, you would either have a box that they can fit in, that they can stand up and sit down, mm -hmm. or have something huge where they have more than enough to, room to move around so they don't damage any of their feathers or anything like that. Yeah, my show boxes are 10 inches wide and about 20 inches tall. All right. Now, this next question is one that is loaded anytime you ask any poultry keeper this question. Uh -huh. And to be honest, a lot of them don't know the actual answer. How many do you have at one time? And now I'm sure we all know exactly how many pens and coops we have, <laughs> but how many do you have at one time? Mm. Well, Jennifer, look, Jennifer just said, like, oh, don't call on me for that. <laughs> I notice she's down. avoiding eye contact. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would say that if your feed is delivered on a pallet, the number's a little high, <laughs> but you don't know. I would add 28 pounds. Oh. I would hatch upwards of seven or 800 birds a year, but I was wow. selling a lot of baby chicks. I didn't keep that many. I would keep two, maybe 300 because I also sold a lot of adult birds. I probably, of my birds that I wanted to keep 50 or less yeah. at the most, you have to be just absolutely ruthless in culling, mm -hmm. not just reds, but any breed. If you're, you need to weed down to about 10%. Those are going to be your top birds. Get rid of everything. Get rid of the other 90%. Keep 10%. Yeah. Good rule of thumb. And what your definition of ruthless culling and what's a keeper, somebody else's may be a lot more relaxed. Oh. If we're, if we're talking about reds and, and minor more tan than red and somebody else has a real red one of their coals may be what puts more red into your birds carrie there's no doubt about it the longer you have birds the closer you call mm. so we'd like to interject here though the more pans and coops you have lets you spread them out more and it yes. ebbs and flows. So while I have a bunch of pens, come January, probably 60, 70% of them will be empty. Yeah, you sure don't want to crowd them. You can, breed, you can grow out, then you'll have coals, and then you'll be back down to just breeders again. Yeah. Just because you have a bunch of coops and pens doesn't mean that there's birds in all of them all the time. I've got three empty breeding pens and... An empty 10 by 20. Mm. I've got an empty two. You're ready to start hatching. I just start saying, y'all need to put eggs in the incubator if you got that in this space. Come on. <laughs> no. So what I, I, I got to, I'm going to rotate my pens because I'm going to clean them out, do everything, condition the pens. And I am a wintertime hatcher. I have some lighting that I, I started my lighting program about a month ago. Because I like to, I like that 16 hour day. For my birds, not for me. <laughs> but once the day starts shortening, I like to give them a break until they're through the molt. And then I stretch that day back out roughly 30 minutes a week. And if you live anywhere near me right now, about 3.30 in the morning, you're going to hear a bunch of roosters crow. That's just, it's getting starting to get dark at, Five o'clock now, we're an hour and a half away from dark. So I like for my lights to go off about an hour or so before dark, right when I'm feeding them, because I like for the roosting process to be as natural as possible. And Jeff, there you go again. That's me listening to you. That's, That's true. Jeff, Jeff got me on lighting and he, he taught me a few things about lighting. And then that rabbit hole happened and, and I traveled down it. And, and I learned about the blues and the reds and what does better for this and what does better for that. And you can get something to work all across the line and how many Kelvins does it need to be? All that stuff is a whole new 
rabbit hole that you can yeah. go down. You need to repost that. I think people need a reminder as the days are getting shorter. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I can do that. Let's see. Ooh, here's another question that I've had because y'all, when y'all travel long distances, mm -hmm. you've got food and water in with your birds. I don't because I'm afraid of making a mess. And I also have a truck that has a little stiffer suspension. How do you keep birds with water when you're driving? Carrie, my feed and water is not in with the birds. Okay. It's outside of the area that they are in. Gotcha. I have uh, little wooden dowels. Yeah. About they poke they their, heads, get their heads through. And then I have a little tray out there that has look like little Dixie cups mm -hmm. with feed and water. Yep. Yep. No mess. Yep. What about you, Jennifer? Uh, mine, I don't travel that far. I don't go that far from home. So they, I actually use uh, moving boxes, cardboard boxes, and we have a two inch hole saw and we drill holes on all four sides of the t and we keep them in the dark cardboard. I think the farthest they've gone is three hours. And so I don't feed or water them. We leave so yeah. early and then I feed them in the show coop before we leave. And they've got water that whole time, too. And they're fine on the way home. An yeah. ideal situation is I sell the birds while I'm there, and I don't come home with any. <laughs> See, y'all are lucky. You live relatively close to shows. Yes. My closest show is about three hours away. I just about have to pack a lunch to get there. I think it's a rule that every time I drive through Ohio, I have to bring birds home with me. <laughs> My wife knows that I'm going to Ohio in a few weeks and she's she asked me point blank she's like what are you bringing back what? and i was like i don't know my but wife does not ask me that i, I just think, get admonished don't bring home anything to eat i think mine's mine is curious because i'd like to have an emu oh oh lord i'm just throwing that out there oh and you're going on the dark side gary you ain't right oh, don't do, right. Look, Don't do okay, it. Don't do it. I want one to keep stuff away. A couple of my kids have got to where they like coming back into my chicken yard because they're not scared of any of my chickens. And that's my place. Go so, get you a hatchery red male or a hatchery legged male, and he will keep them out. Or, or, or I, I thought about a games. goose. I thought yes. about goose. Geese. Yep. Now, game, they're not scared of game. Mm -hmm. now, now I have one or two that that the of my games that don't like anybody but me, and they won't go in those pens. But <laughs> yeah, they start coming back there. So if I could free range like an emu or geese, you're just trying to keep your kids out of the coop. <laughs> That's my place. Hey, I've got a big old coach, and I'll give you. He'll keep everybody out of there. That's right. I need, next time I come by there, I need to see if me and him can get along. Cause if me and him can get along, but he don't like anybody else. He don't like anybody. I I've got to... a little black Spanish Bantam that will put the fear of God in anybody. <laughs> can I let it free range? You can have him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if I can catch him. <laughs> I've got some that I can't, I haven't had leggings in a year, but I have two that are free range and sometimes i'll see them in the trees behind the house at night and sometimes i may not see them for weeks i think that a raccoon got them and then they come back what type of water cups do you recommend using at the shows now i me personally when i think of this i'm all i'm almost tempted to get a couple of those little white cups because i got some of the same type cages that they use at those shows just for conditioning because a wise man in the top right corner told me that you put your cups on the side to yep. get the birds used to standing yep. sideways yep, and you make it as much like a show as possible to lower their stress so they'll do their best right. which is why he has recorded audio of the show and he has those same type coops and stuff like that. So I would think when conditioning for a show, I would use exactly what they're using in the shows. 
Yeah. Those just red paper cups, right? Yeah. White oh, ones. A Most, problem with those paper cups, red males can have big combs on them and they can have a hard time getting water out of them. Yeah. So yeah. what I do is I use the one pint, they're heavy black plastic and they'll mm -hmm. hang right on the wire. Yeah. Cage cups. That's the, the cage, cage cups. Made cage specifically cups. for that. And I just take enough. When I leave, I just put some in the car, take them to the show and I use them. So they're mm -hmm. used to eating out of, they're eating out of the same thing, drinking out of the same thing. Mm -hmm. So that was something I learned at my first show. You take a jug of water with you mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. otherwise you make a lot of trips to the bathroom to get water for your bird. Yep. Yeah. 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 And put electrolytes in it for them too. Hey, here's a suggestion for me. Instead of an emu, get a donkey. <laughs> get a mini donkey yeah son you just gone off the deep end tonight yeah because your kids will be out there riding that donkey yeah no kidding yeah i would get a big old mean you only get one goose if you get a pair yeah. it don't work yeah. yeah you have one single gander yeah you want the biggest ugliest one you can find yeah. yeah so while i'm at ohio i go out to the sale barn no <laughs> no and i find one so i can bring something back from ohio you don't bring anything Great. home from a sale. No. Uh, quit being stupid. I wouldn't put it. I wouldn't put it in my yard for at least thirty to forty-five days. Yeah. I still wouldn't bring it home. You don't know mm -hmm. if you're bringing mites home. You don't know if you're bringing MG home. You don't know if you're bringing. In, you don't know what. That is true. Okay. Yeah. There ain't a chance I'm bringing a bird home from a sale. Yep. Okay. Sorry. And there. Yep. I believe. That is all the questions that we have. All anyway, right. It was good conversation. Folks, we appreciate you joining us tonight. We've had a lot of fun doing this show. I think we've covered a lot of ground. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Poultry Keepers podcast, where we talk about poultry from feathers to function. We hope you join us next Tuesday for another great episode.